Welcome. My name is Andrew Sandberg, uh, and I'm a researcher at the Future of Humanity Institute uh, at Oxford University. And of an, about a year ago, I met uh, my co-author Thomas Moynihan. This was the first time we met, uh, and the last time so far, because then COVID arrived, and we were supposed to work on another thing. And then we discovered this wonderful question, what about wireheading? What about the myth of putting electrodes into the heads of rats that causes addiction? What does this tell us about artificial intelligence, computers, civilization, and how we think about what it means to be an agent and a being that can feel pleasure? So I'm very happy to give this talk and I would like to acknowledge uh, Thomas and the hard work in uh, making this possible. And you should all read his excellent book on existential risk. So the story begins a while ago uh, when people uh, started worrying about the future. And in particular, uh, when uh, many people started worrying that we might go down the wrong route. So here's a quote from uh, uh, Omar Handran, a leading uh, thinker about the safety of artificial intelligence. And when he was talking to fellow futurists, uh, they all brought up that maybe we would become wireheads. And then he refers to these experiments where rats were given the ability to directly stimulate the pleasure center by pushing a lever. And the rats push the lever until they died and they ignore everything, food or sex, to do this. And you have probably heard this story before because it's part now of the myths of our culture. And this talk is going to try to look a little bit about the story before that and how we ended up thinking about wireheading long before any rats actually got the electrodes into the crania and how it might affect our actual future and what it might tell us about how we quite often have some loose ideas and then we get some science that we latch on to and say, yeah, what, and we told you so. Here it's uh, evidence that this is an actual problem. So the real classic paper about this and that is in 1954. And you can say that in 1954, James Olds discovered pleasure. So if we look at the paper, especially a sequel paper in Scientific American that describes it a bit, you have this standard setup. There is an electrode in the septal region of the brain of a rat. The rat presses a lever, gets a stimulating signal, and then the question is, what happens? And Olds had already a bit earlier in 54 found that if he stimulated the rats, they seemed to want to get more stimulation in that spot. So then he and Miller followed up with this paper and uh, it generated uh, a bit of science. The interesting thing that was going on here is of course that this became construed as stimulating the pleasure centers. As I'm going to come back to, this was actually somewhat revolutionary at the time. Also, of course, it led to a lot of uh, thinking where people were uh, started to envision this, not just in rats, but in humans and in civilizations. Before I really get started, I like to point out that there is a difference here between the traditional fears about vice and addiction. Already in, in the in Odyssey, uh, there is the island of the lotus eaters where they're just while away their time in uh, pleasure. And certainly any civilization that has encountered anything addictive will know that that's a bit risky. What makes wireheading interesting is that this concept that using techno science, we can make something that is supremely addicting. And as I uh, will show, uh, we might even worry that this hampers the civilization itself. So the link here to technoscience make it much more far reaching. Now, the fun thing here is of course, wireheading was around long before the rats. So already when Alessandro Volta invented the first batteries, he tried of course stimulating himself and get, got electric shocks uh, and he didn't like that very much. And he tried sending an electric shock through his head and he concluded that was really bad, he felt it very disagreeable and felt like maybe something is boiling here, you shouldn't do that. But others didn't take that safety advice uh, seriously. Johann Wilhelm Ritter, a German chemist, uh, started experimenting uh, systematically with uh, giving himself electric shocks. And he seemed to have become somewhat addicted to it. 
he kept on um, stimulating every part of his body. And at first we might say maybe that's systematic, a bit like the entomologist who's been trying to get stung by the most uh, um, uh, painful insects and create a, a pain scale. But most of his contemporaries started noticing that he was behaving as he was addicted. He was getting disheveled. He was not caring too much about friends. And indeed, he was reporting that stimulation of the sexual organs could be quite pleasurable. And eventually he died young, and many ascribe that to, well, he was just giving himself too much electrical stimulation. Now, what happened when, uh, later in the, in the 19th century was that people did a careful study of electrical stimulation of the nervous system. Gradually, it became clear how nerves worked using electrical signals. Tools for stimulation were developed. In the 1930s, Penfield did the stimulation on the surface of the brain of patients during local anesthesia and could report how they experienced it. Tools for implanting electrodes were de developed. Gradually, a field of electrophysiology was maturing. At the same time, in psychology, the dominant uh, paradigm um, was behaviorism. So behaviorism basically argued, you shouldn't talk about the inner experience. That's unscientific. That's not how we do it. We can only look at what we can observe and make operational. And in particular, saying that you have a desire to do something, mm, yeah, what does that actually correspond to? And people had this uh, concept of drive reduction of motivation, which is basically a cybernetic theory. So you have some uh, resource, let's say that uh, you're starting to have low blood sugar. That means that uh, now you get a disagreeable sensation because uh, you're feeling hungry and that goes away if you eat something. So you get a feedback loop that causes behavior that makes you eat. Similar for all the other desires. And this is basically the idea that the only reason we do anything is to return to homeostasis. There is this um, uh, baseline and once you're there, you don't want to do anything. Now, this, of course, leads uh, to an interesting uh, question, but um, if you want to uh, talk about what the rats are doing, uh, then you should expect it uh, to just, if there is uh, something it can do that doesn't actually remove uh, any hunger or thirst, it will probably not do anything. But that's the opposite of what happens when you stimulated the rats. Instead, they got very, very excited and seemed to want to do more. So, this is where Old's experiment kind of broke the, uh, the old mold. And he actually showed that it looks like the rats like it. And he could show it in both in a scientific way, but also in the Scientific American paper, he was actually talking about pleasure centers, something orthodox behaviorists at the time would say, that's unscientific. And later on in his autobiography, he even pointed out that, yeah, the rats actually did uh, seem to enjoy it. You can actually recognize uh, rat facial ex expressions if, if you're around them. Enough. So what happened was this was part of what torpedoed the classical behaviorist theory um, of drive reduction. Then there is another interesting thing, that's the myth of self-starvation. So in the original experiments, uh, the rats uh, definitely didn't die. They were spending an enormous amount of effort pressing the lever, uh, quite often several times per second. Uh, but it wasn't that uh, they just did that and then uh, they uh, fell ill because we didn't want to eat. Instead, what seemed to happen is that there is a competition against other drives. So in later experiments, uh, people started recognizing that actually if there is a choice between self-stimulation and food, sometimes self-stimulation wins. And there are indeed experiments uh, that do lead to malnourishment. Uh, so it seems like, yeah, it's not like it totally wins, but there is a competition, just like we might have a competition between uh, going to a lecture versus eating versus uh, playing computer games. We need to uh, decide which of our drives to, uh, we let win, but it's not so easy. And especially some of them, uh, like when uh, this uh, brain stimulation seem to be much stronger. Then of course, it's kind of uh, clear that you could uh, expand beyond the rodent. Uh, so already in, in 1968, there, there is another myth that shows up, and that is the story about a dolphin that um, uh, kind of got um, brain stimulated to death, delighted himself to death after an all-night orgy of pleasure. It's very 60s. 
To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.